Hello Interwebs, welcome to Adam and IT. Uh, a few months ago I did a video about building a full body tracking system for VR, specifically for use in VR chat, but what also works in other uh, VR games that support full body tracking. Um, and I've been using that system for the past few months and it's been great. But I'm currently collecting parts to build an improved set of trackers that are a bit nicer. They've got nicer cases, higher performance, and so on and so forth. And during my quest to find new parts, I've come across some new IMUs that I want to use. So the IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit, is the component in the tracker that has the gyroscope and accelerometer in it. So it tells the tracker what direction it is facing and how fast it is moving in any given direction. Um, and then the microcontroller unit reads that data and sends it back to, this, to the Slime VR server. And then by having several of these trackers on your limbs all feeding back into the server, it can then solve to figure out where your body is. So the two main components of the tracker are just the microcontroller and the IMU. Everything else is just power. It's the battery, the battery charger, the on-off switch, stuff like that. Now the performance of a tracker is largely dictated by how good the IMU is. And there are cheap IMUs that are not very good and have a lot of drift, so they're not particularly accurate. And you have to do a T-pose and reset um, sometimes every few minutes if you have really terrible IMUs. Um, and my previous set of trackers use an IMU called the BMI 160, which is a good mid-ranger. However, I bought a whole panel of BNO 085 IMUs. And these are some of the highest performing IMUs that you can get. Um, these also have a magnetometer in them, uh, which is essentially just a compass. So in addition to the gyroscope and the accelerometer, it can also detect the Earth's magnetic field. And this is useful because it means it has another point of reference. It has another degree of freedom by which to determine what way it is facing and how it's moving, which drastically increases performance. Um, so why am I telling you about this? And why did I buy an entire panel of 28 of them? Well, these particular BNO IMUs um, are defective. Uh, so these are actually the design for the official Slime VR tracker IMUs uh, developed by the Slime VR um, community. Um, and however, they did a production run of these ones that unfortunately had a design defect in them. And I'll talk about that defect more in a minute. Um, but as such, uh, all of these blue panel ones got replaced with an improved version that didn't have the defect in them. And all of these were then sold off cheap. So I bought a whole bunch of cheap BNO085 sensors so I could build some more um, trackers for myself and perhaps to sell. So what's the problem with these ones then? Well, the problem with these is that um, due, to a, due to a design fault on them, they consume far too much power. Um, on a good day, a typical tracker like this with your your, your uh, microcontroller and the IMU, this should consume, you know, between 80 and 100 milliamps, absolute tops. It should be less than 100 milliamps, all included. But unfortunately, these faulty BNOs consume about 180 milliamps, um, which means that your tracker will have half the battery life than it should, and the IMU itself tends to run very hot, which could shorten its life. Um, and thankfully, there is a fix that we can do on these to resolve that problem. And so that's what I'm going to be demonstrating today. And the reason why I wanted to make a video about this is because it gives me an excuse to use my Miniware MHP30 hot plate. And I've, had, I've been sitting on this guy for a long time, but I haven't really had an excuse to use it before. And hot plates are a really interesting repair tool. They have various utility to them, but they also show just a different and less destructive method of soldering um, that is very good when you have certain devices that can be very sensitive to heat, such as these guys. Because ultimately, this is what's called a MEMS device, a micro, micro electromechanical system. And that means that inside these things is effectively a very small mechanical device. There is a very small compass in here. There is a very small needle that twists one way or the other under acceleration forces. Um, and these things tend to be very delicate. So you don't want to just blast it with 400 degrees of hot air if you can help it. 
And a hot plate like this can allow you to do soldering at much lower temperatures than hot air or a soldering iron would normally allow you to do. So that's what I want to show you guys today. So this video is going to be an interest piece about an interesting fault that these things have and hopefully a demonstration on just an alternative uh, soldering technique that I'm not very well practiced in and I'm eager to get more practice in. So uh, let's roll the intro and I'll tell you more about the fault. So let's start by having a look at the fault that I'm trying to fix. So I've got, um, as I mentioned, I've got this MCU and IMU set up on a breadboard here. And as you can see from the preview from Slime VR, as I tilt and move it in directions, Slime VR can detect what orientation it moves to. And you can also see on screen where I've got the power meter on the USB lead that I'm powering this from. And that is reading in the high 80s. It's looking for up to 90 milliamps as the power consumption. So this is the kind of thing that we expect from, from a tracker like this. I'm not sure the exact division between the, um, uh, the controller and the IMU itself, but either way, we're looking at about 90 milliamps total power consumption. This is what it should look like. Now, by comparison, here is one of the broken IMUs. So again, as you can see, it works just fine in Slime VR. It is tracking A-OK, -okay, no problems there. However, if you check the power meter there, you can see that this thing is consuming 100 milliamps more. It's consuming more than twice the power that it previously was. If I put my finger on the IMU itself, it's generating a lot of heat. I can't hold my finger there, that's starting to burn. So that's not good for longevity. So what is the fault with this then? Why is it using so much more power and how did I fix the other one? Let's take a look at the schematic for this device. So firstly, Tony over on the Slime VR Discord channel did all of the actual discovery for this fault. Um, and what he found is that when he was looking at the BNO08X datasheet, which I've got in front of me here, if we have a, if we have a look down at the pinout here, uh, let's see, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Here we go. He found a problem with pins 15 and 16, which are labeled environmental sensor, I squared C, clock and data. And if we switch over to the microscope and have a look at how those are actually connected on the defective sensor, um, you can see here the pins 15 and 16 are here and here. So that's 15 and 16. And they are currently pulled down to ground. So this is a ground plane here, and they're both pulled down to ground. So what do these things actually do? Well, if we go on down to page 33, so this is the environmental sensors interface. The BNO08X provides support for environmental sensors connected over an I squared C interface separate to the host interface. So firstly, this is a completely separate I2C bus. It's not the host one that connects this IMU back to your MCU. Um, and it's designed for connecting up temperature, humidity, and pressure sensors for barometric readings and stuff like that. Um, so it then says, if the sensors are not required for a particular application, the I2C bus should be correctly terminated with pull-up resistors, as the BNO08X attempts to discover sensors at reset. Um, so here's the big factor. Because these two pins are pulled down to ground, effectively the chip is just sinking current into the ground plane here because it's trying to pull those lines up to pull the data bus for any sensors on that bus. However, because they are pulled low, it is just sinking current into them. That's why it's got the high current draw. So typically with unused pins on a chip, if you're not using something, you generally just pull it down to ground because that implies just do nothing. But because I2C as a protocol is normally high, a la a, one, a logical high means nothing, and logical low is a pulse of data. So for I squared C, you have to pull it up to the reference voltage. In this case, these pins should be pulled up to the 3.3 volt rail. And that's what the problem is. Um, so the simplest solution here is we can just leave them floating. 
Um, we can just leave them floating and it will do nothing. And that's actually what the fix is for this. So what we need to do is disconnect these two pins from the board. Now this looks fairly straightforward. We could just cut across here, right? But there's a problem underneath the chip the ground plane is underneath the chip and also connects to these two pins from underneath where we cannot cut the, the trace. So we actually have to remove this chip completely from the board, cut the trace on both sides of the pin, then put the, the chip back on. And that's the actual repair that we're going to be doing in this video. So interesting fault and um, you know big kudos to um, Tony for discovering it and unraveling what went wrong here. Um, and as a friendly reminder, on the official slime boards, uh, this fault was fixed. However, on these particular ones, they remain faulty. So let's get one of these guys onto the hot plate now, and I can show you how that bit works. So in order to do the reflow on this, I'm going to use this MHP30 mini hot plate from Miniware. And uh, this does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a 30 millimeter square hot plate. Um, and hot plates have got various uses in soldering rework and in repair. Um, they're often used as preheaters just to keep heat into the circuit board that you're trying to work on, um, which makes soldering easier. Because if you're working on a big heavy circuit board that's sucking all of the heat out of your soldering iron or from your hot air station, it's very difficult to actually bring things up to reflow. Um, but they do also have another use, and that is just for prototyping stuff. When you're working on a smaller circuit board, especially something that's this big, a little widget, it doesn't have a lot of thermal mass. So you can just heat the entire board up to the point where all the solder on the board will melt. Because solder actually has a surprisingly low melting temperature. It's only about, you know, 160, 170, something like that um, for typical solder. However, because the board and the losses between your soldering iron and the board is so high, most of the time people run their equipment, a la soldering irons and hot air stations, way higher, like 350 to 400 C. But with a, with a mini hot plate like this, you can actually work at much lower temperatures. And this is not only just less dramatic, but it's significantly more gentle on the thing you're trying to fix. Um, because if you've got a very gentle chip that doesn't like getting belted with hot air or scorched by a 400 degree soldering iron, being able to work on it at like, you know, up to 200 degrees is much gentler and much less likely to damage anything. It's also arguably a lot less dramatic because you just watch it heat up and then you just pick the device off. I demonstrated doing this process in a very recent podcast that I did, and it was my first time using this thing in anger, and it actually caught me by surprise by how quick it was. But once you know what to expect, it's actually quite zen to work with this little thing. So um, it's got various settings on it for what temperatures it will heat up to. You can set a ramp in there so it will go to one temperature, wait, then ramp up to another temperature, then wait, and so on. So I've just dialed in two stages for now. I've got 100 degrees, which is going to be my standby temperature, and 200 degrees, which is going to be my reflow temperature. So uh, let's rearrange the camera, and we'll take the chip off the top of this board. Right, so we're now just heating up to M1, which is going to be 100 degrees. The hot plate gets up to this temperature fairly quickly, and it's got a natty little LED in it that changes color to indicate the temperature. So we start at green, which is cold, and it's got yellow, which is this thing is warm. And then once it hits white, that's the you're going to burn yourself territory. And initially, we should see absolutely nothing happening because we're not hot enough for reflow. Right, we've overshot M1 by a long shot. I'm going to go up to M2. All right, we're now heating to M2. So keep an eye on... So now, if you keep an eye through the microscope here, in a moment, you should see those little solder blobs melt. You can see the capacitor in the top right is about to go. It's mo There was a little bit of movement there. There we go. You can see it's all starting to boil. And I would say that's just gone molten. You can see the solder blobs are all dancing. Here we go. There we go. So I've taken the chip off and I'm now just going to take the board off of the heat. All 
Right, I don't know what happened to my 200 degrees target. Right, I'm not sure what happened with the massive temperature overshoots there. That was um, that was not planned. However, because I was watching it very closely and we moved as soon as things started happening, wasn't really an issue. Um, this is exactly why I want practice with this guy. Anyway, we've got the chip removed. Let's take a look. So we've desoldered the chip from the board now. That is off. And we know which way around it goes because it's got the dot in the top left of the chip there. And that dot corresponds with that dot up in the corner there, which shows that pin, pin 1 goes in the top left. So let's just put that guy to one side out of the way. So you can see here the problem now where we've got pins 15 and 16 and they connect to this ground plane over here, but 16 has a connection to this ground plane underneath the chip, which also connects to other ground pins there. So this is why we had to remove the chip, because we need to cut not only across here, but also at that point there to isolate the pin from the rest of the ground pins. So now comes the tricky bit where we actually have to cut these traces. And this is, uh, this is harder than it looks if you don't have very specialist tools. Now, in the podcast that I did recently that I mentioned, um, I went through a couple of different methods for doing this because I wanted to determine what the easiest way forward was, or rather the most practical way, knowing that I had a panel of 28 of these to do. And there were, you know, chat put forward various suggestions. We can cut the traces. We could also just rip the pads off altogether. Or another option that people suggested was to use solder mask. And we tried all three of these methods on the podcast, and we had various degrees of success. Cutting the trace is the easiest and fastest method to victory. Um, however, it leaves a scar on the board, so to speak. And as an example of what that looks like, here's another one that I practiced on. And you can see here where I've cut across that trace, and there's a corresponding cut underneath the chip. So this leaves an ugly scratch on there, which is just cosmetic, but... You know, I was I thought to myself, you know, is there a nicer way of doing this? So the other method we tried was to just tear off the pads altogether, but that proved quite tricky because where we're on a ground plane here, these pads are very well attached to the board. If it was a pad that wasn't attached anywhere, like this one here, or it just had a single trace going to it, it would be relatively easy to get the knife under there and just rip it up off of the circuit board. However, ground pads are very well attached and do not want to go without a fight. <clears throat> Another option that people mentioned was to grind the pad away using a Dremel or something like that. But to do that, you need one of those teeny tiny little micro Dremel grinder tools um, because any traditional Dremel is enormous by comparison. Remember, this is the size of my little fingernail right now. So we're working with something that is extremely small. So you need very small tools. And I don't have one of those micro grinding pencils. Um, so... The solder mask, well, the solder mask is certainly possible, but was very fiddly to do. When I tried to apply some solder mask, we ended up with a slight bump that stopped the chip from sitting flat. And the solution there would have been to continuously shave down the solder mask until you had just a very flat film that covered the pins without creating a bump. But the amount of work involved in that just seems very excessive when I have a panel of 28 to do. So I'm opting to cut the traces instead. So I'll show you how that, how that works now. Let's just bring my microscope down as low as it can go. So now we have a clear sight of what we're doing. And I'm using this craft knife and we're just gonna cut across there and then we're gonna cut down here. And we're cutting across here because that's nice and accessible. We could try and hug in tight around there. However, it's actually surprisingly difficult to cut traces. So we want to do just straight lines where possible. So here we go. Let's just start digging in here. And I'm going to get right up close to that pin because what I want to do is cut out a section of the trace. Should do there. And then I'm going to make another cut a little bit to the left. And we're going to try and dig out a little bit between so we get a nice separation. Let's 
think that was it. I'll just get a toothbrush and a bit of alcohol just to wash away the bits. Okay, that looks like that's done the job. I think we're down, I think we're through to fiberglass there. I'm just making sure. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that we're through that now. So we need to make a slight gap there because if we don't, when we reflow the chip, the solder might just flow and just bridge the gap again. And that's a really small gap as it is. However, that is wide enough that in my experience, we're not going to get a bridge across there. The solder is going to want to stay here where there's exposed tin. So now let's get across this gap here. And I need to be careful because we don't want to damage this trace and this via here. So I'm going to do a nice controlled cut. I'm going to swing wide and go low down to the right hand side, just so I don't risk going straight across that trace. Whoops. See there, I slipped and just went straight down. Luckily, this isn't anywhere important, but you can see how easy it is to slip when you're trying to cut through copper traces. All right, I think that's probably through, so let's do another little cut to the left. Okay, and now I'm just going to try and dig out that channel I've just made. There we go. And a bit of alcohol to clean up. Right, and those traces look pretty cut to me, so now I'll put my multimeter into continuity mode and we'll just check to make sure. So I'll put the black probe onto the ground pin here, and this capacitor is grounded, so we should get a beep, which we do, and we shouldn't get a beep on these two pins. Nothing, and nothing. However, this ground pin up here should beep, which it does. Good. So that guy is now done. Let's put the chip back on the board. So I'm going to add just a little bit of flux under here to help everything flow. We don't want too much because we don't want the chip to swim away or float on top of the flux. We want the flux just to flow out around the chip and onto those solder joins. Sit that guy on top there. Roughly in alignment. Doesn't need to be perfect. Just got to be roughly centered like that. And now let's bring the hot plate back in. All right, here we go. The hot plate is already up and it's just immediately melted That's that flux. The chip has gone a little bit wonky, but as you see the solder flow, it's just moved back into place. So because, these, because the hot plate was already up to temperature, that happened very, very fast. And just for posterity, before I take it off, I just want to nudge the chip just to demonstrate. There you go. You can see how it's just floating there. That's how we know it's ready. And now we just take that off the heat again. That all happened a bit quicker than I wanted it to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, sh I shouldn't have preheated the hot plate there, actually. That would have slowed things down. But it's good enough. Right. So now I'll hit this guy with some more alcohol just to clean up, and then we can inspect the solder joins. And you can see there that the chip has soldered down 
dead flat against the board, which is perfect. There's no discernible gap underneath the chip. And it would be okay if there was a slight gap there, as long as the solder joints are intact, that's fine. But that's an ideal outcome there. So now what we want to make sure is that the solder didn't bridge the gap that we cut underneath the chip which is unlikely, but we're just going to make sure. So once again, I'm going to put my multimeter into continuity mode and I'll check it again. So multimeter on ground, beep check, ground, not grounded. So those pins are definitely isolated now. And I'll just check the top pin, which should still be grounded, which it is. And these other pins are grounded because there's just another path around. The ground plane on a board is flood fill. So anything that is not anything else is ground, basically. So anywhere that where there is not another trace will all be connected to ground. That's standard PCB design. So this guy is ready to go back onto my little test breadboard. Right, so I've just stuck a pin header on that super quickly and plugged it back into the breadboard. And now we'll power this guy up. And as you can see from the power meter, we're now drawing 85 milliamps. So we've taken 100 milliamps off of the power consumption of this thing, which is great. And obviously, does it still work? Well, as you can see, according to Slime VR, that works just fine. So that's an ideal result. Now, it's taken me quite a while to do that single one. However, now we know the method for this, I can actually auto, well, I can't automate this process, but I can standardize this process. And what I would probably be inclined to do now is I will probably snap out the rest of these modules in one go and t set the hot plate up and just remove all of the chips all at the same time. So I'll end up with a pile of circuit boards and a pile of chips. And then I'll go through, cut all the traces systematically, and then put all the chips back on at the same time. I mean, I might do them in batches of like four or eight or something like that, just because I don't want to do them all in one sitting. But as you can see, once I do that systematically, the process could be significantly faster. It's slow enough that I'm not surprised that Slime VR chose not to fix these themselves. These things were supposed to go into a production device, the production slimes that are available to purchase from a store. And you can't really have bodge repairs like cut traces on a production device. It's not very professional. If this had just been a bad uh, resistor or something like that, someone could have sat in the corner with a hot plate and a packet of resistors and just swapped the resistors over to the correct values. However, because the chip actually has to be removed in order to fix this, that turns this into quite a faff of a job that even someone with the right equipment is going to take quite a while to do. And if you have like a stack of these of these boards, I don't know how many of them they had, but it was quite a lot, I'd imagine. I'm not surprised they didn't want to fix them. Anyway, I hope you guys found that kind of interesting. If you want to know more about these uh, trackers, then um, I encourage you to go and check my original Slime VR tracker video. Um, otherwise, if you found that interesting just from a soldering and electronics repair perspective, then I don't have a lot more content like this. <laughs> However, thank you for watching, and thank you as always to all of my channel subscribers, Patreons, Twitch subscribers, and all the rest of it. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.